not just ritual of giving a Bible to a newborn, nor Bibles to all of our first graders. The scripture is a significant part of the life of every serious Jesus follower. And I invite your attention this morning in the scripture, the book of 2 Corinthians, your copy of God's Word, or there's a pew Bible in the pew rack in front of you. I invite you to find it. And uh, we're going to read just three verses from one of Paul's letters, his second letter to the Corinthian church, and to all of us who believe in our God. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, I'll be reading verses 16 through 18. And the title of the thoughts I'll share this morning, Two-Way Mirror, Two-Way Mirror. If you're physically able, I'll invite you to stand while I read this scripture. Hear the word of the Lord. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. God, add your blessing to the reading and sharing of your word, so that the same Spirit who inspired it will enlighten us as to its meaning, In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 2 Corinthians 3.18, it has that makeover word, that big New Testament word that's not found a lot, but when it's found, it is a significant word. It is that metamorphosis word, the exact Greek word becomes an English word, metamorphosis. It's found twice in the Gospels, both referring to the same event, to the transfiguration of Jesus in Matthew and Mark. The two other times it occurs, Paul uses it, one in a command to us. Paul says in Romans 12, 2, be transformed, this word. And then he gives us a hint by the renewing of your mind. But basically in Romans 12, 2, it's a general word. Paul, what do you mean by that? If I'm going to be transformed, that's a spiritual makeover in my life, how does it happen? He explains it in the verse I read a moment ago. 2 Corinthians 3, 18 gives us the process of how that transformation takes place. And we're going to look at the words prior to the phrase are being transformed. The words in verse 18 prior to those words will help us to understand the process. So here they are. And we, who with unveiled faces, all reflect the Lord's glory. First, the little word all. All reflect the Lord's glory. Paul is writing to a group of Jesus followers, to followers of Jesus who happen to live in the city of Corinth. And he says to them, this transformation I'm describing to you is a possibility for every one of you. Not just something reserved for a few of you who are highly spiritual and live especially close to God. It is a possibility for every Jesus follower. Note, it is a possibility, but not a certainty that it is taking place. But the possibility is there. Every Jesus follower has the opportunity to have this spiritual transformation going on in our, in their lives. Now, some change is inevitable. It is absolutely certain. It is an absolute guarantee. 
If you were alive in 1969, my guess is when you first heard the news yesterday that Neil Armstrong had died at the age of 82, you thought for a moment about where you were on Sunday night, July 20, 1969, when the Eagle module landed and Neil Armstrong's boot became the first one to touch the surface of the moon. Here's the incredible thing about that. Technology changes with certainty. The smartphone you have possesses more computing power than the entire equipment that took Apollo 11 to the moon. More computing power in your smartphone that was in the spaceship that went from here to there and back. Some change is inevitable. Spiritual change is not. Spiritual change does not happen automatically. It happens only if we're willing to let it happen within us. So all, Paul says, all of us can be transformed but it is not a certainty that it will be for all of us. And then some real strange language. The verse begins by saying, And we who with unveiled faces, look around, I think pretty much 100% we're all with unveiled faces. I don't see a veil-covered face in the room, and uh, neither did we have one in the 815 service as well. But we all with unveiled faces reflect the Lord's glory. I'll not take the time to read verses 7 through 11, but here's what's happening. Paul is saying we have a privilege that Moses or nobody else had in the Old Testament. Moses used to go up on Mount Sinai and meet with God. Moses used to go inside the tent, uh, tent of meeting and meet with God. And when Moses would come and join the people, there was this evidence that somehow he had been in the presence of the glory of his God. It was a brightness of his countenance. And either they were so spooked by it, so afraid of it, or Moses didn't want to be reminded of the fading nature of it he wore a mask he wore a veil over his face and all they could see were the sunlight like arrows going away Moses wore that veil and he did so after meeting with God and experiencing here's a word we use a lot and not sure what it is glory glory we say glory to God Glory be. Let's give all the glory to God. To God be the glory. And what is glory? The glory of God is this. It is the immensity of God, the awe-inspiring majesty of God, the greatness of the nature of God in who he is. But that's not the most important thing. The glory of God is his intimacy, not just his immensity. The glory of God is about his love, his grace, his compassion, his kindness, and his forgiveness. So when we talk about the glory of God that somehow describes his nature, his character, his being, it is not the greatness, it is the goodness. It is the love of God that is his glory. The word's found 10 times in verses 7 through 11, so it's pretty significant. So Moses had the opportunity to have personal relationship with God, to somehow be in the glory of God, and you could see it on his face, but it was not permanent. Now he comes to say in verse 16, now for us the veil is taken away. Whoever turns to the Lord, that is, whoever gives life to Jesus, whoever invites Jesus to come and live in your life, you don't need a veil like Moses. For the one who shows us most the glory of God, that's Jesus, 
lives now within us and we experience in a most intimate and direct way the glory of God. So he says in verses 16 and 17, whoever comes to Christ, you don't have to wear a veil. You're directly accessible to God. You have the freedom to be in a personal relationship to him. And that gives the possibility. That gives the possibility of this transformation taking place. Here it is. It's a possibility for all of us that is. All who has been willing to say, God, I realize I need you in my life and I commit all of who I am to you. That person can experience the glory, the goodness, the kindness, the compassion of our God. Here's what that verse says, 18. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory. Now that leaves the word reflect. Reflect. I'm reading from the New International Version and it translates that one Greek word with one English word reflect. Some other good translations do it a little bit differently. The King James says, beholding as in a glass. The American Standard Version, the New American Standard Bible, the New King James says, beholding as in a mirror. They take that phrase to translate one word. The Holman Christian Standard Bible, brand new translation says, are looking as in a mirror. So which is it? Is it a glass? Is it a mirror? Is Paul asking us or saying to us, you're transformed by looking into a glass or looking into a mirror? Which is it? And my question is, why can't it be both? Why do we have to choose between glass or mirror? It's hard to describe it. It's hard to depict it. But we know what it is. And it's confusing in what we call it. We call it a one-way mirror, or we call it a two-way mirror. And it's describing the very same thing. A one-way mirror or a two-way mirror is something that serves as both a glass through which to look and a mirror that reflects. Sometimes it's used in observation, in an educational setting. You know the drill. The observer is watching a teacher with young children and they can't see her. When a child walks up to that, they just see themselves. It's a mirror to them, but it's a glass to her. Hopefully you've not had any direct experience in this, but police also use a two-way mirror, either in an interrogation room or putting out suspects in an identification process in a lineup. It's both a glass and a mirror. So which is it, Paul? Are you saying we look through a glass to see the Lord's glory? Or we look through a mirror to see the Lord's glory? Well, I got to tell you, it it seems like Paul's saying it's a glass. The word translated reflect or seeing as through a glass is a word that means to gaze intently, to contemplate, to study, or to stare. Now you and I both know it's impolite to stare. We stare for one of two reasons. We stare at stunning beauty or we stare at something horribly bad. We see the latter. We stare at those kinds of things on the freeway. We have a special technical term for it. Rubbernecking, sure. We stare at things and people. And we have two responses. When you see someone staring at us, we either make a statement or a question. What's the question? 
What is it? What are you looking at? What are you staring at? And we say it really cynically. What are you looking at? Or we make a statement. What's the statement we make? Take a picture, it'll last longer. You want to look at me, then you just take a picture and record it. Yeah, it is impolite to stare. Here's what I'm saying to you this morning. It is not impolite to stare at Jesus. And part of what this word means is, Paul says, we all stare at the Lord's glory. And what is the Lord's glory? His goodness, his love, his compassion, his forgiveness. And where better can that be seen than in the life and ministry and teaching and compassion of the Lord Jesus? And so Paul says, you can be transformed. It can happen for you. The image of Jesus Christ can be reformed, reshaped, seen in your life if you're willing to stare at God's glory in the life of Jesus. Now, where do you go to stare at Jesus? Here's one place. Just constantly staring at what we see Jesus doing recorded in God's Word. And that's why early on in our year of the makeover, we spent the month of March saying, and the most important foundational spiritual discipline of spiritual transformation is letting God's word work in us. Where else do you stare at Jesus? In prayer. We bring our needs to God, and we know Jesus can do what we ask him to do. We know he's going to be with us, and so we offer him. We're thinking about, we're meditating upon, we're contemplating, we're studying him, we're staring at him when we pray. And here's another place. I come to church to stare at Jesus. Here's what I mean by that. I see the love of Christ in the attitudes and actions of persons who follow Christ. And so I'm reminded every time I come to church, I'm reminded of the good work of Jesus in the lives of so many people who have a variety of life experience. And I'm thinking, how in the world could anyone endure such pain? And I see the comfort of Jesus <clears throat> in people at church. So it could be glass. I think it is glass. I think Paul is saying to us, if you want to be transformed, just stare at Jesus. And you keep staring at Jesus and spiritual transformation in your life cannot help but take place. And when it does, I think the other thing Paul means here is mirror. We reflect the Lord's glory. I do think first it is a staring, seeing Jesus through the glass and letting him transform us. But once that happens, then our lives become a mirror in which Others see the glory, that is, the goodness, the love, the compassion, the forgiveness of God in us. That happens when spiritual transformation is taking place in our lives. We are like a mirror. We can see both the person of God and the purpose of God in our lives and the more we allow this transformation to take place, the more others can stare at us in wonder. Not wondering how we could claim to be a Jesus follower and do those awful things they see us do. But stare at us in wonder. In wonder of the grace and the glory and the transforming 
power of our God. So I say let them stare. And I pray that when they stare at us, they'll see the beauty of Christ within us because we've been staring at Jesus and letting that transformation take place. I say, you keep staring at him and let them keep staring at you. Amen? In a moment, I'm going to lead us in a closing prayer. And there is no way in which any spiritual transformation takes place in your life until there's a beginning. Until you take the veil off, to use Paul's language. That is, until you take the mask off of denying to God who you are or what you've done, avoiding accountability to him, until you turn to God and say, I know you love me and sent Jesus to die for me, and I do want Jesus to come and live in my heart and forgive me of all my sin. That's the beginning of the possibility of transformation. And if that's the beginning you need, I'll be here after I pray. And when we're dismissed, you come and find me and you can make that most important decision of committing life to Christ. If you've already done that privately, as Blake had done, ready to announce that publicly, be baptized into the fellowship of this church or join this church in any way we receive members. I'll be here. You come. You come find me. It is the year of the makeover. <clears throat> and here's something that will help you this week. If you uh, need anybody in our administrative suite in our office. Tomorrow morning, we're vacating all of the administrative suite. That will, uh, it'll be involved in the renovation, in the makeover. So the entrance to our office is now the Porta Cache entrance on the south side of this building, not the north side. And we've been moving out of our offices. I boxed up 70 boxes of books and moved off my shelves. And I intend to get somebody else to move them back in and get them back on my shelves, but that's another story. But that's where we'll be. The ladies will be in the college department. When you call the church, it may be a while before you get to talk to someone because we'll, we, have, we may have to send a runner down the hall to find them. But uh, you be patient with us while we're out of our habitat here, and that's a part of the ongoing, ongoing uh, renovation. But that's just a word that you need. Sad word, former youth minister Wayne McAfee, who served this church in 1978 to 83, passed away last night from a heart attack, uh, night before last now, and uh, we want to pray for Margaret, his wife, and their two grown daughters, uh, Bethany and Heather. We want to pray for that family. Wayne was either 59 or 60, uh, years of age and so a uh, good youth minister and we certainly want to pray for that family as we pray as we pray for others let me lead us in a closing prayer holy father if we belong to you and believe in you help us god to keep staring at your son studying the scripture that talks about his love for us and all that he did meditating upon who he is and how interested he is in our lives through prayer and seeing Jesus at work in the lives of others who belong and believe as well. And Father, we pray that we'll be staring at your son in such an intense and consistent way that that will be changing us, changing the way we speak, the way we act, the way we choose, the way we relate to others, so that when others stare at us, they'll see the character, the conduct, the Christ-likeness of our hearts. Father, we pray for those who need to begin the journey by giving life to you. We pray, God, that you'll move them to a point of commitment 
even today. Father, as we continue in the makeover of the building, in the makeover of the body of Christ, those of us who belong to you, we pray that because you're at work, we'll be letting you change us in a metamorphosis kind of way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.